during my uh, fourth year at Dallas Seminary, um, I took an exegetical class as a Hebrew major uh, on the Psalms. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. That was back in, well, 85, so a long, long time ago. Uh, at, during my senior year uh, in this class on Psalms, the professor would, he would walk around the class and arbitrarily assign passages to you to exegete. So you had to tear apart that passage uh, identifying everything about it. And then when you were done, you had to put together a, 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 a form outline of the argument of the passage. And then you had to then put it into a homiletical preaching form. And then you had to preach it. So I was 26 years old at the time. And uh, it was my senior year. And you, you, you want to nail this sermon. And so uh, the professor, you know, he's going around assigning the passages to everybody, and I was sitting there kind of calculating, you know, what's going to fall on me, because you wanted something that, what, not an obscure passage, you wanted something that could, you could just really bring the heat with, you know, your senior year, uh, and so he's going around assigning passages, and uh, I was watching the, some of the really good ones be given away, and the other ones that were kind of obscure, uh, guys were getting, and then it, then it got to me, and he uh, said, Martin, uh, your, your passage is uh, Psalm 52, and then he went to the next guy. And I looked down at Psalm 52, and I started reading it. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world am I going to preach that? And that is going to be a tough passage. Uh, and I didn't know that much about, the, about it. Uh, it, was a, it was about a man named Doeg, uh, an Edomite, who is a, in, who's an enemy of David. He's a, he's a dragon. I mean, he's, he's a guy there to make life miserable for, for David. And I'm sitting there as the professor was going in the room thinking to myself, uh, at, at 26 years old, I don't really know dragons. Everybody's my friend at 26. And I, I, did, I never really dealt that much in my lifetime with, uh, you know, prolonged troublemakers. Uh, and so I'm, I was just sitting there like, oh, this is, this is going to be a terrible senior sermon. What am I, I going to say? I don't have any illustrations. And then I became a pastor. Uh, don't get me wrong. I love my job. Uh, I love what I do. Uh, and uh, especially as I'm preaching on my birthday, I'm actually working on my birthday. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. I think I feel 35. Um, but uh, it's kind of interesting uh, because at what I looked at back then as a one part sermon, now is like a 30 part series with full illustrations. I mean, I have encountered uh, uh, sheep, goats, and wolves all of them. Uh, and I'll never forget the first time that I ran into Doeg from Isaiah chapter 52, because he's alive and well, as I found out as a young pastor. Uh, at 31 years old, a few years after I left the PhD program at DTS, I, um, I was in a church plant. Uh, and it was in California where I was from, and I was in a school. I had 19 members. I mean, these two rows would have been basically it. I was so excited, uh, ready to conquer the world for God. And I, I'm 19 members and about 30, 35 in church on Sunday in a cafeteria. Uh, it was really interesting. And, uh, and so as we began to grow and attract people, um, we, we acquired this couple that I, that I heard in town was a really godly older couple. Uh, they were spiritual, uh, from what I heard, servants of God, blah, 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 been in the church for years. Uh, and, and so I thought, this is a wonderful addition. I'm, I'm glad they're here. And, and, and he was a, a businessman with a huge company. So, and, and so we needed all the tithers that we could get when you had 19 people. And so I was real excited. And so one day he called me up and he said, I'd like you to take you out to lunch. And we're going to go to Carl's Jr.'s. I don't know if you've ever been there. Yes, it is an excellent hamburger. Um, and so we went to Carl's Jr.'s and I met him. And I'm looking up on this as being a mentoring opportunity. The older saint talking to the younger guy about the ropes of being a godly man, blah, blah. I'm excited. And so we sit down and having burgers and uh, things, you know, talking about this and that. And then uh, we get, get near leaving and he uh, says, well, I, I just need to just kind of level with you. I'm like, yeah, like what? He goes, uh, well, my wife and I, uh, we're not going to be able to stay at the church because we're going to be moving into another state. Uh, and so we're just here, you know, for a few Sundays more, and then we're leaving. Um, but before we left, I just wanted to give you uh, an observation, what I'd notice about you. I'm like, great, shoot. This is what he told me. <laughs> he said, uh, I just want to let you know you are not going to make it. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? <laughs> this side laughed, that side's totally somber. This side's, yeah, that's ridiculous. This like, yeah, that's a total possibility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he goes, you're not going to make it. 
And I'm like, uh, like, why am I not gonna make it? He said, uh, son, you know, I've seen a lot of leaders in my day and time. And uh, you know, uh, you just don't have it. You don't have what it takes to lead, to preach, to teach. And I've seen a lot of ministers in my day and time. So, uh, you know, you need to be looking for some, kind of, some other kind of employment. Praise God. I'm like, oh, are you too bad my drink's empty? You know, uh, I mean, you gotta be kidding me. So with that, he, you know, we, we left and he walked out to his car. I walked out to my car. I was, I was it's pr- pretty hard to stun me. I was stunned. I was like, really? I just started out as a pastor and this big time businessman is telling me I'm not gonna make it. Um, what was his name? Hmm? Doeg. Doeg was his name. I had this flashback to 1985 when this happened. Uh, I was like, I have now met him. I met him. Um, I don't know if you've met him yet. Uh, Doeg is all about uh, not building up churches, but blasting churches. He's not there to build up a Christian leader. He's there to tear down a Christian leader. He thinks that's his spiritual gift. And I have run into him uh, many, many times. And I've, uh, I've learned, it's going to take me a few minutes to get to my sermon. Just hold on. Um, running into those kind of individuals, uh, the troublemakers, uh, has taught me much about myself. Because you have to do a lot of introspection. Is it true? Is it not true? Uh, I've uh, had my character shaped, honed, and crushed by God uh, many times. Uh, and I've learned also how to identify Doeg. Or sometimes it's uh, Donna the dragon. I've run into her too. Um, they are most destructive. And if you're a shepherd in a church, you have to identify who that is. Because they can be a wolf. And they are not there for good intention. Perhaps uh, you know a person that you've, you're dealing with right now. Or you've dealt with them in the past. Uh, and if you haven't dealt with them yet because you're 26 thinking, everyone loves me. Uh, we'll just keep living for God. Uh, and eventually you'll find out that they won't. They will, they will attack you. Uh, if you're dealing with, a, with a Doeg the dragon, uh, how should you deal with them? How should you respond? This was my big question when I was in my early 30s. How do I deal with these kind of people? Um, and it, David, uh, fortunately, uh, dealt with one of them. And so we can learn from his, his life about how we should deal with the dragon, whether it's uh, Doeg the dragon, Donna the dragon, how should I deal with them? Because you want to do it in a biblical, kind, compassionate way, uh, but you also want to represent God well. So it's going to take me a few minutes to get to the first verse I want to talk about. And then we're not going to go past verse one, all right? I know you're shocked, but that that's as far as we're going to get because this is going to be a two-part sermon. So uh, I have much to say. Let's listen to what he says here in the passage. First of all, he's going to tell us, that's an easy passage to outline structurally. He first is going to tell us in the first five verses that how you deal with the dragon is you give the dragon some warning. And my dad, who was a very godly man, uh, when I was dealing with the dragon like this man, uh, came up to me one time. And my dad had been the chairman of an elder board many times over when I was growing up. And my dad came up to me one time as I was telling him about dealing with this individual. Uh, and he, he, said, God, uh, he, he said, God help the man who strikes the shepherd. That's what my dad told me. Uh, and I said, Thank, thanks, dad, for that word. Um, uh, what is a shepherd experience? Well, we find that in verse one. Let's read verse one giving the dragon some warning that they're messing with the person of God, the child of God. Uh, David says, I wrote this to the chief musician. It's a contemplation of David. Uh, And when did this occur? Well, when Doeg the Edomite went and told Saul, who was the king, and said to him, here's the word of gossip, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech, unquote. Then David asked Doeg a question. Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? And then he says something positive. The goodness of God endures how long? Continually, continually. That's as far as we're going to get today because there's just too much to unpack as we look at this. You must first of all, in dealing with a person like that, uh, you do have to do some introspection. Ask yourself, uh, you know, anything I need to work on? Uh, and if you, it, it, it also depends on who's telling you these things, but sometimes there are things that you need to work on. Uh, other times you need to stop and let the person know uh, that uh, they're treading on uh, thin spiritual lives to take the tact of which they do if they're a troublemaker. Uh, in the New King James Version, and in the, uh, well, most, most of these versions have uh, in the header of this verse uh, uh, the statement, the historical statement of the passage. And then verse one, verse one in English text starts out with, why do you boast? Uh, oh, mighty men. Uh, really, the header of the text, as I've told you before, is part of the Hebrew text. 
Uh, and so the Hebrew is, is, a, is a verse off uh, from the English text. What that means is that historical notation that this occurred when Doeg, Doeg attacked him uh, is part of the inspired biblical text. It's from God. God wants you to know. Uh, and to be able to analyze what David's going to say in Psalm 52, it just stands to reason that you must understand that the context historically in which he said what he just said, which means you would have to go back and read 1 Samuel 21 and in 1 Samuel 22, to understand what, what's the ramifications of Doag making this statement to the king about David going to the house of Himelech. What does that mean? You cannot understand how this troublemaker functioned unless you understand the historical background of the passage. And so, since our time is limited, I want to just kind of paint the passage of what those two chapters teach us about Doag and David, 1 Samuel 21 and 22. Let's just summarize. So David is a young man. Uh, who goes to, to uh, fight Goliath, Israel's enemy. And I've been in the Valley of Elah many times with people. It's a very small valley with a little river, dry riverbed now cutting through it, rocks strewn all over it. Um, I, I've been there. And the hills upon which the Israelites were and the Philistines were is, is just they're not very big, but you can see, they could see each other and Goliath in between them. Uh, we all know how that went over for Goliath, do we not? Uh, David took him out uh, with, I don't, need a, I don't need a javelin, I don't need a sword. I just need, need my slingshot. And he took him out. Uh, and because of that, he became uh, the, the, the mighty soldier, the Gibor of Israel, the mighty warrior of Israel. Uh, and in 1 Samuel 18, verse 7, it says of the people that when they saw David, young David, after he took out the mighty Goliath, the giant, uh, they said, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. Well, when uh, King Saul heard that about this young man who took out Goliath, happy, unhappy, unhappy. And it's interesting how the root of jealousy can creep, creep into your life. Someone else has something fantastic happen underneath you and they're way younger than you. And all of a sudden you're jealous of them. And that didn't bode well because that became a root of jealousy that sprung up in king, uh, the king's life. Uh, and from there he went uh, after David physically to, to kill him, to kill him. Uh, we know uh, later um, that after jealousy took over in his heart, uh, David, not long thereafter, was uh, playing on his harp. That's what he did. Uh, harp was, you know what the harps used to look like. You could just kind of hold them in your hand, like an ancient version of a, like a Stratocaster with just no electricity, just in your hand, just playing. He's playing for a king and soothing music, and the king gets so upset at him because the guy can fight battles, and he, he can also play an instrument. He's really super jealous. So he throws a, a spear at him. David is young and nimble uh, and dodges it and escapes. Over the next few years, uh, David was on the run, as we know from the first and second Samuel 21 and 22. Uh, he's um, on the run from, well, the dragon Saul, because he's a dragon too. Because dragons always try to take out and silence godly people. That's what they try to do. Um, the, over the years, uh, King Saul, this dragon stripped David down. And this is what happens in God's providence because God will take even the actions of a dragon in your life, a troublemaker, to strip you down, to remove crutches in your life that you lean on so that you will eventually lean on him. So if you thought you were leaning on God wholeheartedly, God will say, let me remove a few crutches and lower your pride down a little bit and humble you. And then you'll have the opportunity to lean on me and see me work. Boy, have I been there. God works in that in the most profound way. So what were the crutches that God uh, removed from David as David fled from the troublemaker Saul? Uh, many, and we'll only cover two at the present time because uh, we're looking at this uh, chronologically. First of all, he removed David from his powerful position. You can imagine you're a teenager and you take out Goliath that nobody in special ops in Israel can, they're not even, they're afraid to even go out and look at the guy. And let alone a little teenager goes out there without armament and takes him out with a slingshot. So he's the ultimate special ops warrior guy. Everyone loves David. What does God do uh, in his battle with King Saul? He removes his, st his status as a mighty warrior in Israel. He loses that, humbles him. Uh, God does that in your life. Is he, if he's gonna use you greatly, he's gonna remove your crutches. Number two, uh, David um, marries uh, Saul's daughter, Michal. He marries her, uh, but to marry her, uh, he had to, according to 1 uh, Samuel 18, uh, her father said, if you want to marry my daughter, now that you've taken out Israel's foe, Goliath, uh, I, I want you to give me a dowry of 200 dead Philistines. Could you imagine if your future father-in-law said that? What would you do? 
uh, are, you, are, you, are you kidding me? I got to kill 200 people to marry your daughter? I mean, bizarre request. Uh, David uh, does it, goes out, uh, takes on the enemy, uh, takes out all of those soldiers. And this really freaks out Saul because not only did he take out Goliath, now he's taken out 200 hardened Philistine soldiers. Uh, he can't get rid of this guy because he's thinking, if I send him out there to get rid of the Philistines, surely one of them will get him with some kind of shot. Didn't happen. He uh, marries Saul's daughter. Uh, and then as Saul is coming to kill David, uh, his wife tells him, uh, I think my dad's going to take you out. You need to flee. So David flees. When his dad, her dad shows up, uh, he says, like, where's your husband? And she lies and says, Dad, he was threatening to kill me. So I told him, you've got to get out of here. So his wife lied. If you study 1 Samuel 19 and following, uh, you will see their marriage was never the same again. God removed that relationship he leaned on. This is what God does. He removes relationships that you lean on to isolate you so that you will lean on him. Fleeing from his home, David wound up with a friend. His name, Ahimelech. Ahimelech of Sam, uh, Psalm 52. Ahimelech, who was he? Uh, he was a priest of Israel in their temporary sanctuary uh, in the little city of Nob, which was located uh, on Mount Scopus, which is right next to the Mount of Olives, which is directly across from uh, the, what would eventually be the temple in Israel. And, and I've been on Mount Scopus many times. Uh, in fact, if you come at uh, Israel from the Dead Sea, you go through a cave system, a tunnel system into Israel, and you open up this beautiful vista to see Jerusalem down below. And then right next to you is Mount Scopus. And we always pull the bus in there with joyous music playing, and we all file out of the bus, and we stand on Mount Scopus and look at the Temple Mount. It's awesome. And then you can look over there at the Mount of Olives where Jesus rose into the heavenlies. Now, that's where they are. Nob is for Himlech as the priest, eastern slopes of Mount Scopus. Um, but David winds up there uh, on the run from Saul and he lies to the priest why he's there. And he tells the priest, I'm on an assignment from the king uh, and my men are hungry. Well, he's not on an assignment from the king. He's running for his life from the king, but he lies to the priest. Never lie to your pastor. <laughs> Just don't do it. He lies straight to the priest's face. And he tells him, we're really hungry. Remember, we're building up to getting to Psalm 52. We'll get there. You hanging on? So after he made this bold request to the priest, the priest tells him, look, buddy, uh, we got no other food around the temple, uh, you know, this makeshift temple, all, sanctuary. Uh, all I have on hand is the table of showbread. So 1 Samuel 21, 3, uh, here's, here's the bold request from David. Now, therefore, Ahimelech, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. The only thing they could find was a table of showbread dedicated to God Almighty. You know the story? You know what, what, what the priest did? He was a pragmatist, just like Jesus was years later. Because Jesus is going to talk about this in Matthew chapter 12 when Jesus feeds his disciples bread uh, on the Sabbath. He's going he's to tell the Pharisees, God's more interested in caring for people in their needs than he is in ritual. It's interesting. But Ahimelech takes the table of showbread bread and gives it to David's soldiers to eat. Wow. Now, we're getting somewhere when we get to 1 Samuel 21, verse 7, which says this. While that was going on, now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. God put him there. His name? Doeg. Where is he from? Uh, he's not an Israelite. He's an Edomite, Israel's ancient enemy. He's the chief herdsman who belonged to Saul. He's got a lot of power. He's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of weapons, too. Interesting, while David and his ragtag special ops team are eating the table of showbread, sitting there watching this whole thing is Doeg. Does he say anything? Nope. He just takes note of the situation and thinks to himself as a troublemaker, how I can take this information and use this to my political advantage. First Samuel chapter 22 says in verse 8, all, Saul speaking, all of you have conspired against me, and there is no one who reveals to me what my son has made a covenant with the son of Jesse, his son Jonathan. And there is not one of you who is sorry for, uh, for me or reveals to me my, that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Then answered Doeg, who's sitting there with the king later, the Edomite, who was set up over the servants of Saul, and he said, uh, I, I know where David is because no one would tell the king. He said, I just happened to see him. He said, I saw the son of Jesse uh, going to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of uh, Ahitub. Uh, and he inquired of the Lord for him, and he gave him provisions, and he gave him a sword of Goliath, the Philistine. He said, I was there. 
I, I saw when his men were given bread uh, from the priest, I saw it, and then he didn't have any weapons. And so the priest who had the sword of Goliath, that massive sword happened to be there, he gave him that as a weapon. I saw all that. See, this was intel that was, well, it was everything that the king wanted. The king wanted intel. He got it. Who'd he get it from? The troublemaker. Why did the troublemaker give that intel? Because he wants to silence David. That's what troublemakers are all about. They want to silence godly, moral people. Uh, uh, Saul, we know from uh, 1 Samuel 22, uh, commands uh, that his men uh, uh, deal with Ahimelech. Verse Samuel 22, verse 17. He commands them to kill Ahimelech when he brings him in for questioning. Did you do this? Ahimelech's going to say, yeah, I did this. I, I, fed, the, I fed David and his men. Why not? Uh, then uh, Saul tells his men to kill the priest and his 85 priests who came with him. It says in 1 Samuel 22, uh, but the servants of the king would not lift their hands to strike the priest of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, you turn and kill the priest. So Doeg, the Edomite, turned and struck the priest and killed on that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod, 85 priests. Also Nob, he went over to the Nob. He wasn't finished. Uh, he, he took up the, the city of priests. He struck with the edge of the sword men, women, children, nursing infants, oxen, donkeys, sheep with the edge of the sword. He went way above what, what Saul was asking because he's a wicked man. He's full of himself. He silences the entire little priestly village. Isn't that interesting? That's what troublemakers do. They want to get rid of the godly voice, the godly person, so that they can be in a position of power. How do they do that today? Oh, a variety of ways. A variety of ways. How the dragons operate. Uh, they'll use a lawsuit. They'll use Twitter. They'll use Facebook. Uh, they will uh, put mean-spirited things on Yelp. I mean, that, there's, there's, it's, it's an unbelievable opportunity for troublemakers today. Uh, how should you respond when that happens? I'm getting to my sermon. Are you still with me? How should you respond to them? Let's look at how you should respond to them when they do these things to silence you. Um, verse one, let's go back to verse one of Psalm 52. With all that in mind, the historical context, it says, to the chief musician, a contemplation of David. He wrote this psalm and this song for Israel to sing into the future to never forget that you're going to face troublemakers. So take note. And what does he say? How should you deal with them? Um, he says to him, why do you boast in evil, O mighty men? Uh, this is the first uh, step on what you should say to a person who's wreaking havoc in your life and making you unmiserable and keeping you up in the middle of the night. And you know that you're morally, spiritually right and they're wrong. What should you do? Uh, this is a figure of speech called sarcasm. And sarcasm is something which cuts. Uh, and he uses sarcasm here to get the man's attention. Uh, and uh, the very first word in the Hebrew text is the word ma. Uh, and the word ma is uh, why or what are you doing? Uh, and it's out of the normal word order. And he puts it there to get your attention, to get the troublemaker's attention to say, what are you thinking about? What are you thinking about when you attack that which is holy? Uh, and he uses the word when he, he, talk, he uses the word boast. Um, the word that he uses here is Hillel. Hillel is the great word for hallelujah. He uses the same word. It's just used in the wrong context. Hallelujah is, is raising, praising God and raising him up. Uh, but here it's raising up and boasting over that which is evil, Ra, that which is evil. See, it's hard to comprehend that some people uh, really do like doing evil things. They really do because they're evil. And when you run into somebody like that, it kind of takes your breath away, uh, especially if you love God and pursue God, and you run into somebody that's the essence of evil, and you're trying to wrap your mind around, what is their issue? Well, they like light, dark, they don't like light, they hate, they hate light, they love darkness. So what does David say about a person like that? Um, well, you can kind of level with them to say, what are you thinking about? Do you really think you're gonna get far with your kind of lifestyle? He says to him in a positive fashion, you, you call yourself a, a, a mighty man. Uh, the word is gibor, and I told you earlier, that's the name for warrior. David was a mighty warrior. He says, I'm a mighty warrior. You call yourself a mighty warrior. Was he a mighty warrior? No, what was he? Job occupation, what was he? Chief of what? He's a sheep herder. He's the head of all the sheep. He's not a mighty warrior. Who did he kill in battle? Nobody. He killed unarmed priests. 
And then after he took out 85 priests that had no weapons and weren't trained in self, you know, in defense or combat, whatever, then he goes over to their town and takes out their wives, their children, and, and, and their animals. This guy is just, he's brutal. He's brutal, which is what a troublemaker is like. David says, uh, you're, you're, not a, you're not a warrior. You're, you're a coward. That's what he's telling him. And then he gives him a, a flash of insight and tells him, you don't realize the goodness of God endures continually. This is, this is insightful. He says, I'm going to give you a word of warning. You are living as if you are all that, but you're not all that because you're failing to realize that the living God always has chesed, loyal love is what it means in Hebrew, toward his people. This is interesting. The goodness of God endures continually. Uh, I don't know if you look in your text in your Bible, but the word endures, the verb, is, is probably italicized, meaning it's not in the original Hebrew text. So it means you can take it out because it's not in Hebrew. It's supplied so you can read it in English. It's not in Hebrew for good reason. It's not there to make it totally emphatic. David says to his troublemaker, let me give you a word of warning. The God that I serve, he always loves his people. And I'm going to leave out the main verb to make the sentence stilted to get your attention. Let me warn you, God's love is it never abated. When I was going through all that with this individual, and I've been through it with other individuals over the years, uh, you sometimes question, is God with me? Does God care about me? Does he love me? Is he going to be faithful to me? When is this going to end? God is always there, as I'm going to show you in just a minute. God always exercises his loving kindness. Jeremiah chapter 9. Verse 24, it reads this about God. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That's the greatest thing you could ever do is know God above all things. That I am the Lord who exercises, present tense, notice what he constantly exercises, loving kindness, justice, righteousness, where? On earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. God says, never forget my character, no matter how hard it is when you're dealing with Doeg, I'm always there behind the scenes. Now, this is where understanding participles is most important. I know you love participles. Do you not? You don't sound convinced. Yeah. Excellent. Spiritual people in the front row. I'm praying for the rest of you. There's two ways to classify the fact that David says God's love endures and, the, and that Isaiah says God exercises continual love for his people. Two ways to interpret the participle. Number one, it's a durative use of the participle, meaning God's always doing this behind the scenes of your life, no matter how south it's going. He's always working to be righteous and justice towards you eventually. Or it's an iterative use of the participle, means God will come into your life at different points and show you his glory, show you his greatness, and deal with the person in question, show you his justice, and you'll stand back in awe. It's one or the other, but God's always there. He's always loyal to you, even when you don't think he is. I introduce you to another Doeg that I met in my pastoral lifetime. Um, he took issue with most of my sermons and wrote me constantly that he took issue with them to teach me how to preach. This businessman of this huge company, another man, this is whole another, another individual. One day, uh, and he was always giving me negative comments on everything I preached about. That was very encouraging as a young pastor. Uh, one day, I got a telephone call from his executive secretary. And I'm thinking to myself, is this guy gonna ever leave me alone? And he's never even been to seminary. How does he know how to exegete and all that? I mean, who is he? One day I got an interesting telephone call from his executive secretary. And so I remember when the phones had flashing lights on them? Remember those days? So my, the button pops up. It's my secretary. I hit the button. Yes. She said, uh, you know, so-and-so is on line two. Uh, he wants to talk to you. Or no, not him. It's a, it's a secretary. So I, I hit the button. Yes. I don't know the lady. Uh, and she said, uh, she told me her name. Uh, and uh, she said, uh, uh, I am so-and-so's executive secretary at this large company. And uh, I just, I need to talk to you. I'm like, oh, okay about what? And she said, well, for the last year, I, I've been using the dictaphones, uh, and my boss, this individual, has, uh, has made me uh, transcribe all of your sermons for a year. And she said, I've been transcribing them, you know, on my, you know, IBM Selectric and typing away. Uh, and, and, and she said, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a Christian, but in addition to typing these things, I've been reading them I'm going, oh, okay. And she said, I'm just calling to let you know that not only do I know God now, I know how to walk with God. And I just, I just called to tell you thank you for the impact of the word of God in my life. <laughs> I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. Now, what had God just done in that one phone call? 
he took a young pastor, worn out by Doeg, a couple of Doegs. Sometimes they gang up on you. God, God told me that one, one, one phone call. I see you. And, and I, have, I have lived off the food of that one phone call for years because God said, no, let me feed your soul to show you my justice. Remember the old song, uh, His Eyes on the Sparrow? Is it true? God has his eye on the smallest little bird. What did Jesus say? If I have my eye on the smallest little bird, do you think I don't have my eye on you? Because there was many times I thought he took his eye off of me. But what's he say? No. What does that little song say? Here's some of the words of that song. Why should I feel discouraged? Why, when the, why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? Because when you're battling with Doeg, you want to get out of Dodge. And long for heaven and home. When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he, his eyes on the sparrow. You can put your name in there. And I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow. I know he watches me. Why do I sing? Why do you sing? Because you're happy. Because God's with me. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow. I know he watches me. I like the second verse. I don't think I have the words for it. But here's, they're my favorite. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear. And resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and my fear. Though by, though by the path he leadeth, but one step I might see. But his eyes on the sparrow. I know he watches me. Do you know that? I know it. If you're dealing with a Doeg, um, an Edomite, or a, a Debbie, the dragon, uh, whose eyes on you? Whose eyes on you? The Lord. Uh, David played a harp. I play, a, I play the piano. And a lot of times I just play hymns at home um, just for worship. So this is kind of between me and God. And my vision's 2800 now, so I can't really see the music as I used to be able to. So you are a gracious church, are you not? If not, pray for your soul. Oh my gosh. Happy birthday. Oh, what are you doing here? Happy birthday. Well, hello. Well, that's kind of shocking. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, that was a surprise. Well, thank you. Outdoors balloons? Yeah. Thank you. No. Well, thank you. Let's sing together. Oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. Yeah. Happy birthday. 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 Happy bir
Happy birthday Thank to you. you. <laughs> Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Thank you. Thank Happy you. birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to surprise me. Very cute. Now, if you're if you're dealing with a troublemaker, uh, don't be troubled. Uh, whose eyes on you? The Lord's eyes on you, and He will work in a profound way in due time to take the crooked path and make it straight. That's just what He does. We'll have prayer counselors here if you want somebody to pray for you. Uh, and let me pray for you right now. God, thank you just for today, opportunity to worship in music, uh, opportunity to worship in song, uh, and uh, opportunity to worship in the word. Take it and use it to your glory. Encourage those who are beaten down. Uh, pick them up, embolden them, and strengthen them. Uh, we thank you for how great you are, and may we not flinch when we're in the fire. In Jesus' name, amen.